uh, my good friends. So the, uh, uh, have you done a, a session on Leo Designer yet? Jad, do I need to talk about that? How much do I need to say about Leo Design? We, we've just mentioned the term, but we know we haven't talked. All right, so I will walk through uh, very quickly uh, how we developed the, the what are the parts uh, of the activities that we had to do in order to develop this with uh, Leo Designer. So Leo Designer takes a model-driven development-based approach to creating an adapter. And essentially what you can do is divine, design a model of your domain and the model of the tools suite that you want to use. It will generate a, um, an application, a web application for you that implements that domain and provides the uh, OSLC services that you ask for. We'll look at those in detail in just a moment. Uh, and then provides some abstract co code that you have to go finish uh, in order to adapt to your particular data sources. So I won't go into the details of the uh, Leo designer itself. I will look more at how it's used in this particular concept, context. So this is um, the, um, the domain model that I created for the Watson IoT platform. Now this domain model uh, is something I just simply made up. I, I, what I did is I went and looked at the REST APIs for the Watson IoT platform and abstracted those APIs into a more logical model. Um, uh, and I had in mind uh, what kind of linking I wanted to do. So I was essentially putting Watson IoT platform resources in the context of continuous engineering. So what I was interested in is uh, sort of thinking about the development time and lifecycle management aspects of Watson IoT platform applications. Um, and so I was thinking about, well, what things do I need to link to? What things are going to be impacted when requirements changes and, and defects are discovered? And so the model is somewhat purposefully built. So there was a, a sort of conceptual abstraction that I went through on the uh, actual IoT platform resources in order to project them uh, in a manner that, uh, that fit them in the context that I wanted to use them. Are there any questions about that before I go on? No, okay. I don't think so. It's fine. Uh, so you can see what I modeled was a device type uh, and uh, a device type has a physical interface, which has uh, a number of event types that describe the events uh, that can be received at that physical interface. Each one of those events has a JSON schema that describes the data that's the payload of that event. Uh, device types also have a logical interface that exposes that device type to applications. So you can see the idea is that we separate logical and physical interfaces. So what happens is an event comes into the, to the device's physical interface. The event then goes through a device type mapping that maps the physical data to the logical data. And the uh, <clears throat> application typically will use the logical interface. And there can be many of those logical interfaces uh, so that the device data can be exposed different ways for different users. Uh, some other things, some other details is you have devices that are instances of device type. They have this specific uh, device info um, that's a, a standard set of uh, data that's carried on the device. And <clears throat> they're extensible with different metadata. So you, you can see there's two kinds of lines connecting uh, in this diagram. These lines are link types, so what OSLC calls link types. Um, or um, URL references. These dash lines are local references. So these uh, would be considered uh, UML data types, where these would be considered UML classes, if those words are, are meaningful to you. To you. Oh, sorry. Um, OK. Um, so let's go to the next thing. So then, uh, wait a minute. I missed a chart. I missed this chart. So here are the steps you typically go through to develop uh, an adapter using Leo Designer. The first thing you do is develop the domain model or the ontology. Then you specify what CRUD operations you want on which RDF resources. Typically, read will be the minimum, um, but um, it, you will often provide uh, other operations like update, uh, creation, and deletion of resources. 
<clears throat> so those are the uh, services for reading and writing the resources. Then uh, if you can, you can also specify creation factories if you choose to, cre uh, to create resources and provide a UI for creating them. So these are actually separate things. You can have the ability to have a REST, an OSLC REST API to create things through a post, but you don't necessarily have to have a UI for it. That's a separate discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, it was too, too good to be true. Mm -hmm. what died, what died. No more battery. Okay, so I think we lost. Lost this. Yeah. Oh. I know why. Jim, are you, are you still with us? I am. We lost you for uh, maybe one minute, but I okay. think you're back online. I'm just like, I just need to put your <laughs> your presentation on the main screen again. But okay, be ready. tell me when you're ready. Yeah, and then I can share again the... I'm lost. One more post of video. Okay, I think there you are. I think we're ready. Sorry for that, Jim. Okay, um, uh, where did we drop off uh, so I can pick up where I left off? Halfway down this page. Halfway did you down this page. You, uh, how far did we get down this page? Did we complete this page? Halfway. Halfway, okay. So just reviewing quickly, you develop the domain model, specify the CRUD operations you want on those resources, specify which creation factories you want to support. Uh, this provides the REST API for uh, creating resources. Specify the resource preview and domain model elements. Uh, then uh, specifying the OSLC selection and creation dialogues. These provide a UI for selecting resources and they provide a UI on the creation factories if you'd like to, to do those. Uh, and you can also specify uh, which resources you want to support for query, which I, I apparently didn't put in this list. Then you define the tool chain. The tool chain is a, a sequence of, um, or a set of OSLC clients and servers that can be connected together. So the client can consume, a client in the tool chain can consume OSLC so resources provided by a server in the tool chain. So that can integrate a set of applications together uh, that implement different domain models. Finally, you would generate the OSLC server implementation using the code generator, and then you go and implement the abstract methods or the, uh, the, uh, uh, fact that the methods that are in the uh, connector manager that you need to finish in order to adapt to your data source. Any questions on this? No, no? We're, we're okay. Good. So we already looked at the uh, the domain model. So now uh, th in this uh, diagram, we're uh, creating the CRUD operations you want. So you can see I have an, uh, an IoT platform service provider that I've created. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm hitting my mouse. Uh, and I have two service providers in that service provider catalog, one for the Watson IoT platform and one for Bluemix. And the reason there are two here is uh, that I have two sets of resources that I want to bring together in this same service provider catalog, meaning they're going to be provided by the same server. Um, the uh, Watson IoT platform provides the device types and devices, and Bluemix provides the Node-RED applications that now can use those device types. 
So I want to bring both of those together. So in this case, I choose what services I want. A basic capability is the service for uh, reading and writing resources. And I uh, say which resources I want to be able to read and write. Um, and uh, the reason I had to split out device type and device into different basic capabilities is because they have different URL patterns and I needed to be able to expose that. So I needed a different configuration for the basic capability. Okay. Um, then uh, we're going to specify which resources have uh, creation dialogues. So this is that same service provider, the same service yeah, but now I'm adding the services for uh, the creation factories. And this, so this tells me uh, which resources am I going to be able to create from OSLC. And there's usually a, a, a very small, a smaller set of those will typically be uh, uh, created. This is the actual tool chain itself. Uh, the, uh, this is the name of the uh, uh, tool chain I created. Um, and uh, these are the resources that it provides, and it doesn't consume any OSLC resources. So in this case, we only have one tool in the tool chain, and our code generator is only going to create one OSLC server in this case. And this is how you generate the, um, the actual code. You select the adapter model uh, and select the Leo, Leo generator, code generator, generate the code. This is very fast, uh, even on fairly complex models. It uh, takes very little time to create the code. Um, this is an example of one of the read methods. So the method that is created is this public static method to, to get a device type. Uh, and then uh, this is boilerplate code that is created. You can see these markers, um, these uh, uh, structured comments start of user code, get device type, end of user code. This marks the segment of where you enter your code. And so you can see what I've done is uh, uh, I go out to my, uh, my, my one of my implementations to get the service provider info for this request and the uh, uh, IoT ID. That allows me to be able to create an instance of an OSLC client. Uh, I'm sorry, an IoT uh, platform client uh, this is uh, some other code that I created. And what this uh, client does is wrap the uh, Watson IoT platform REST API for my purposes. Uh, then I do a, um, I calculate the ID uh, of the device. So in this case, I'm mapping the uh, ID from OSLC to the URL that's actually used by the Watson IoT platform. Uh, I go out and read that resource. I, that gets me back JSON. Uh, and I uh, created a constructor, uh, perhaps should have used a factory method here, but either, either will work, that takes the uh, JSON that is returned and converts it into a, uh, a Java device type. Um, and this code, the code for this device type was also generated by the uh, code generator. Any questions on the code? Uh, all, all of the app, all of the code that I had to implement looks pretty similar to this. Okay. Uh, so there's some additional uh, information. That I will provide this uh, um, presentation for um, for everyone to be able to uh, get access to these additional uh, resources. Now what I would like to do is uh, briefly, very briefly, show you what this looks like in Eclipse. Uh, can you see this or is it too small? Uh, I think it's, small. We can, uh, it's a bit small, but I, I guess we can follow. But, uh, we... Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm just showing you there's the, there's the tool chain that we use. And this is, um, uh, looks like I don't have the uh, code generator installed in this uh, this is a brand spanking new Eclipse, so I, I haven't installed the code generator yet. Um, this is the code that gets generated. Uh, you know, so I'm sorry, I'm looking in the wrong place. Uh, Java resources. Um, no. Right here. I, it's pretty small on my screen, too, to be honest with you. So here are the Java resources that are created, the interfaces and implementations of all of the domain model elements. 
Um, here's some of the code that I had to implement. So this is uh, an abstraction of uh, the Bluemix uh, organization services and spaces and Node-RED applications. Um, and so, so you get the idea. There's a, a fair amount of code here, but this, this didn't take very long to develop. Okay, so now I would like to very briefly just demonstrate what this looks like. Where did my browser go? I've, oh, here it is. I want to look at this. So, Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We lost the connection again, but uh, we're back online. So you can you can proceed, uh, Jim. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, um, where did we uh, where did we lose you? I uh, think at the beginning of this uh, demo, just uh, okay. the very beginning. <clears throat> okay. So um, this is the debug interface that's generated by uh, Leo Designer. And this typically, it's just a web application that exposes the services, a UI for the services that you specified in your uh, uh, tool model uh, so that you can uh, quickly uh, debug and test uh, visually. Uh, you can also use this web application as a starting point and develop your own web pages and UI uh, as you wish. So this is a, a, a quick way to get a template of a web application that you need. Now, in my case, um, I didn't really need uh, a web application for Watson IoT platform because it already has one. I, yeah, if I recall, I thought I had it. No, I, I, I've uh, closed it down. We'll, we'll start it up again in a moment. There already is a web application for Watson IoT platform, so I don't want it to du duplicate that. What my server does is provide OSLC access to those resources so I can link our requirements, change, quality management, and design management tools to those resources. So it's a, I, I, don't, I need essentially a headless uh, server. But I do utilize this for debugging purposes, so let's go through it. Each one of these service providers corresponds to a Watson IoT platform organization. And the reason for that is we consider a service provider to be something that provides access to a set of uh, related services. Uh, it's a container for those services and a manager for those services. And that's the same role that a Watson IoT platform organization plays. The organizations are where you log in, they're where membership and ownership and access rights are um, done, and they uh, scope uh, a certain set of resources. So if we go to this organization, we can see the resources there, and I think it's logging me back in. That's why we had the little pause there. Uh, and so here we can see the services that are provided. There's the selection dialog services, the creation dialog. There's the URLs for all the creation factories, all the query capabilities, and we can look at the resource shapes. These OSLC resource shapes are the constraints that describe uh, the domain model elements. So what I will do is uh, you can see the kinds of resources that we're able to do, the logical interfaces, event types, physical interfaces, and so on. Let's go look at the device types. So this is the list of device types. This isn't going to make much sense because this is essentially my test environment. Uh, but uh, you have uh, resource previews available on these things. So you can see the small preview.
can I have a small Wi-Fi issue? So.